Okay, so sorry about the uh, kind of abrupt shut off on the previous part of this lecture. I lost track of the time there. But as we were talking about in the last one, it were Mesozoic era, there's just so much going on. So many things are happening. The Earth's climate is changing as tectonic plates move around. We see three mass extinctions. Each mass extinction wipes out major diversity of life, but then that allows new diversity to jump up and flourish. So in a little bit of a parallel example, think about going into a forest, cutting down a couple trees from the center of the forest, and then coming back next season, and all of a sudden you're like, wow, there's so much new growth happening here. It's because that competition's been removed when you took out those trees, and all the stuff that's low to the ground has a chance to get sunlight. That's the idea I want you to think about with a mass extinction. A lot of species get wiped out, but what's left behind now has a chance. And that creates diversity. That kind of triggers and stimulates and pushes the evolutionary process to create new diversity of life. So this is happening on land. It's also happening in the oceans. This is when mollusks really, really start to dominate the Earth's oceans back in the Mesozoic era. So think about mollusks, all those animals that have a mollusk body plan, the snails and the clams and the oysters, those types of things start to dominate. We get other diversity out there as well. Corals, this is where our corals really start to flourish and do well. It's somewhat of a tropical environment in the oceans because of the continental plates and where they're positioned. Corals like tropical water, warm, shallow, nutrient-poor water, and they do fantastic. So the coral reefs of today, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia and the Western Barrier Reef off the coast of Belize, those corals can trace their origin back to the Mesozoic, or I should say those reefs can trace their origin back to the Mesozoic. So it's been going for 100 plus million years since the Mesozoic. And we will see a few other important things happening. Flowering plants now show up on land. We got seeds before, but now we have flowers. So plants that produce flowers that have seeds and are vascular. These first show up during the Mesozoic. So not a major player, but seeds definitely give you an advantage when it's time for reproduction. And along with these plants, the other significant land feature or significant evolution that occurred on land is we see the evidence of the earliest mammals on Earth showing up during the Mesozoic era. Okay, so Precambrian, Paleozoic, Mesozoic. Every time we go from one era to the next, we see the diversity stacking up and increasing and increasing and increasing. Mass extinctions knock it back, but then it rebounds and flourishes once again as life keeps evolving and adapting. This is what the fossil record shows us. So the Earth has had five mass extinctions. It's experienced five. That's what each of those yellow symbols represents is a mass extinction in the Earth's history. Our concern is this red one. That's the sixth one we're moving into. So we talked about that during ecology when we were looking at ecology and conservation biology. The concern is what's going to happen. Will life continue to survive on Earth? Sure. But at what cost? And what's going to happen to our species, the human species, as we continue into the sixth mass extinction? So that one is being driven by human actions. All the five others were natural, were natural events that triggered those mass extinctions. The last mass extinction that happened naturally Number five is known as the Cretaceous Calamity. Now this happened about 65 million years ago, and a massive meteor impacted the Earth down in what's called the Yucatan Peninsula. It's part of Mexico there. 
came in from the south, slammed into the land, created this massive crater, and threw up debris and all sorts of stuff into the atmosphere that changed the global climate. That mass extinction is the one that killed off the dinosaurs. Well, the dinosaurs as we know it, and most of the reptiles. All right, so let's go back to ecology. If you're a big dinosaur, you need a lot of calories. If you're a big herbivore, you need a lot of plant material. If you're a big carnivore, you need a lot of animals to eat. Well, Cretaceous Calamity basically wiped out the producer base by changing the climate. Not as much sunlight, plant life suffered. You lose your plant life, your herbivores starve. Your herbivores starve, your carnivores starve. The omnivores are doing great, but then they also eventually run out of food. Being a large animal, not a good thing during a mass extinction because you need a lot of energy to support yourself. So those guys went out. Climate changed, temperatures dropped, continents continue to move apart. So if you're cold-blooded, you're not going to do nearly as well. And we do have reptiles still on Earth today. Some of them survived that extinction, but most of them went extinct because of all those factors that kept just got hammered the earth all at that same time of the Cretaceous Calamity. Now what survived? Small, warm-blooded, fur-covered, scavenging animals. Looks like possums or some kind of little cat-like creature down there. That's what survived the Cretaceous Calamity. That Cretaceous Calamity marks the end of the Mesozoic and moves us into the Cenozoic. That is the era we are currently in, so Cenozoic. During the Cenozoic, the flowering plants diversify. They do really, really well. This leads to rainforests. So now you have rainforests. Not the entire planet, but Big sections of the earth are covered in a tropical rainforest type of environment. The mammals that made it through the Cretaceous Calamity diversify into all of the different ecological niches that the dinosaurs used to have. Big herbivores. Let's do some mammals in the ocean. Let's do some mammals in the air. Let's do carnivores, omnivores, scavengers, etc. All these guys started to take over basically the jobs that the dinosaurs used to do. So the mammals diversify. Within this diversification and the rainforest, here come your monkeys. So monkeys appear. This is roughly about 56 to 60 million years ago. We see the earliest primates and monkeys, different types of primates, monkeys starting to show up. Now, Cretaceous, calam or Cretaceous calamity 65 million years ago puts us into the Cenozoic. As the Cenozoic continues moving forward, we see the Earth changing. So it's not all tropical environments for the entire time. Interior of the continents start to dry out. They're less humid. That causes grasslands to start to appear. So grasslands, open areas, tall grass, you don't have the trees. We see primates evolve into apes. So they start branching. We have the monkeys, we have the apes, we have another group called prosimians. And this is where we start to get our primate diversity really starting to ramp up and change because of that environmental change that we see happening during the Cenozoic era here. Now as the apes continue to evolve and change and adapt, they eventually give rise to a group we call the hominids. So hominids show up on Earth somewhere around 6 to 10 million years ago. The key thing to know that you are a hominid is do you are you a mammal that is a primate that walks on two legs and is what we call bipedal. That is a big primate feature for hominids. 
Gorillas are not bipedal. Chimps are not bipedal. They went down a different evolutionary branch. Hominids, all of our hominid ancestors, are bipedal primates, bipedal apes, if you want to call it that. All right, so when we look at all the diversity of life on Earth, not everything changes. Sometimes species don't really evolve. They don't have to. They're adaptable. They do well. Or their environment didn't change. So they didn't really need to evolve. These are things we call living fossils, species today that have not really changed much from earlier forms. Do not worry about the little details on these species. I just want you guys to look at examples. So when you see something out there in nature and you go, wow, that looks prehistoric. Maybe it is because it hasn't had to evolve. There's really no reason to evolve unless you can't survive in your current form. So an example, alligator snapping turtles. They haven't changed in about 200 million years. They're pretty much the same. For those who are familiar with these turtles, try to think about what could you do to improve upon that body plan. That's the key. If it doesn't need to change, it's not going to. If it doesn't need to change and evolve for survival, why would a species evolve? Now, take us out of the picture, because you could say, oh, well, snapping turtles need to be able to resist bullets. That's not realistic. Look at natural things. What natural factors would drive that species to evolve? Crocodiles. They showed up 160 million years ago. They were around there with the dinosaurs. They survived that extinction. The only major difference in a crocodile today compared to 160 million years ago is our, our crocodiles today are smaller. That's about it. The coelacanth shows up 360 million years ago. Can't, it doesn't change much. Horsetails, these are those vascular plants that showed up back in the um, Paleozoic. They were huge, 50 feet tall haven't changed much. They've just gotten smaller, but everything else anatomically is pretty much the same. Now tell me what can you do with a shark to make it better outside of the human issue. So if we go back 450 million years, we see shark ancestors. 180 million years for the modern sharks. They haven't changed much. Their environment hasn't changed that much. Their ecological role hasn't changed that much. So they haven't evolved much. They are primitive. They are living fossils. Horseshoe crabs, same thing. You know, these guys really haven't changed a whole lot in the course of their existence. So when we look at the big picture of evolution, what we want to look at is what lines of evidence support it? What do we use to study those lines of evidence? And how many different lines of evidence do we have? And then what are the mechanisms and the processes behind it? And the bottom line is that fossil record constantly adds more support to the theory of evolution. Every year we're seeing new fossils being discovered and they just keep filling in pieces of the evolutionary picture with all the new evidence. So it is a theory because it is supported by facts, by evolutionary information, by anatomy, by biogeography, by molecular data, by there's just a list of things that support the theory of evolution. So when somebody says it's just a theory, they don't understand what theory is. It's widely misused. You hear it on the news all the time. What's the theory about the JFK assassination? They're guessing. In science, theory is not a guess. Theory of evolution is not a guess. We know, we've tested, proven, and supported the fact that species change over time, that species have common ancestry, that species are related, that the Earth is 4.6 billion years old and life existed 3.5 billion years ago. We have all these things built into the lines of evidence that support this idea. So it is a very solid concept in science and the vast majority of biology is based off of the theory of evolution.